Um, okay, well, yes, um, the Netflix series obviously came out last week. What was your initial impression or reaction to it? I was so disappointed. I was really, really disappointed. Um, I had trusted these people to tell my story in what I had hoped would be fair and truthful manner. And um, I feel like I didn't get that. Um, there are, I, I would say that there's some things that the Netflix series did well. I think the Netflix series quite clearly showed that Elizabeth was at the crime scene, okay? And um, so that's, if I, if I would, would try to find something positive, then that would be it. Um, but, um, and, and I think for the most part, it's okay. Um, the last seven minutes to me are outrageous. And um, I think also just from a cinematic point of view, you can tell that uh, they kind of bolted on a surprise ending to the film that really doesn't fit very well with the rest of the series. So you're in there for three and a half episodes and then at the very end, it's like, what the heck just happened here? Um, and, um, you know, the, yeah, so we can talk about what it is that bothers me at the end there. But um, for me personally, it's just painful. Um, you know, I spent 33 years in prison. I fought like crazy to prove my innocence and to get out. At the end, as you know, and as everybody knows, <laughs> the governor did not grant me a pardon. Um, despite all in all, six police officers asking him to, which is <laughs> a strange decision, but not unusual. You know, you think about Darnell Phillips and Diane Fleming and Emerson Stevens. These are all people who were clearly innocent and were only released on parole, not with a pardon. Um, so, you know, they did the same thing with me, but I would hope that the Netflix series would at least tell the story in a fair way. And um, they left an awful lot of stuff out. And at the very, very end, they just say things which to me, you can see from the trial transcript are not true, just objectively not accurate information. And that's a shame for me personally as a human being, but it's also a shame for the viewers because um, they're not getting the whole story. They're just not. Um, you had said to me with the, regards to the ending that that was a preposterous ending that both yes. of you were there. Yes, it's, it's, it's completely silly. And... Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm particularly shocked because I provided the Netflix team the, um, the information which I've now provided you. Uh, but I gave them the actual original documents in a manila envelope from, the 19, from 1991. <laughs> so, you know, they had to handle this carefully, but they did handle it carefully. They just did nothing with it. And I'm talking specifically about in 1991, my then lawyer contacted the manager of the movie theater where I bought tickets. Elizabeth testified she bought those tickets at 4 p.m. And I testified I bought them shortly before 10 p.m. And the movie theater manager was able to tell from the serial numbers on the tickets, right? It's his theater. If anybody knows, he's going to know, right? Uh, he said they were bought sometime between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. before the 10, 15 p.m. showing. So that's an ironclad alibi, right? And Netflix, they had this. And of course, they also had the trial testimony of the hotel manager who said that the dinner menu only went into effect at 5.30. And the Netflix theory only works if you order the room service at four o'clock. And it was not possible to order it at four o'clock. The earliest you could order it was at 5.30. And then you have to wait for the food to be prepared, delivered to the room, signed for. The earliest we could have left if we had gone together would have been at 6 p.m. and just well, it just wait, doesn't work. Could you not have ordered something other than dinner through room service? Um, he, he says that in, 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 I sent you the whole transcript. He said that you can tell from um, the size of the bill that it was enough for two small meals. Um, Elizabeth testified that she ordered two meals plus alcohol, which of course is not true because she wasn't there. And the hotel manager said that. Um, it, the, the bill was large enough for two small meals, but too small to account for both alcohol 
and two small meals. So, you know, there's a total of six police officers who've looked at this case closely. And two of them believe I'm guilty and six of them believe I'm innocent. And all eight of the police officers, whether they're for me or against me, not one of them thinks that we did this together. All the police officers, again, including the ones who think I'm guilty, think that one of us stayed in Washington. It's just a silly theory. And I think it comes from the, you know, kind of a media dynamics, uh, um, a media industry necessity to find something new to say. Because this case is so completely and totally, you know, pardon the expression, dead. You know, there's, no, there's been no new developments uh, since my release in 2019, just no new developments. And now it's 2023 and they find, needed to find something new to say. So they came up with this ending, which as I said earlier, it doesn't even fit with the rest of the series. It kind of comes out of the blue and viewers are going, you know, the, I've heard this from a lot of people, right? Um, what the heck happened at the end? I, th that went by so fast. What was that, right? So, um, and I think, you know, that's a shame. That's a shame because this story is interesting enough without having a fantasy ending, you know? Um, the true, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, it doesn't seem preposterous that two people were there. Definitely, there's definitely at least two people at the crime scene. And, um, you know, I think that's another good thing that they demonstrated in the series. Not everything is bad. Um, and of course, um, then you have to think about who were these two people. And at the end of the day, there is not one single piece of forensic evidence that ties me to the crime scene. No fingerprints, no DNA. The hair in the sink is not my hair. The shoe print is too small to be mine. Uh, the sock print is up in the air. You know, the, the fair opinion on the sock print is anybody could have left that. And there's, you know, there's a certificate of analysis from not anybody, any sides expert, okay? It's from the Bureau of Forensic Sciences that one of Elizabeth's brothers could have made that sock print, right? Um, today, I launched an uh, uh, Instagram uh, story uh, um, and a reel um, to show that. The sock print proves nothing, right? But there's no forensic evidence that places me at the crime scene. And anybody who's watched CSI knows there's something called Locard's Principle. Every contact leaves a trace. It's not possible for me to have been at the crime scene and leave nothing. It's just not possible. That's not how science works. It's not how forensics works. Something of mine would have been at the crime scene and they've got none. And of course, this is the really interesting thing about this case. A lot of people have done a lot of talking, right? Including me. And another strange thing that's missing from the Netflix series is that Elizabeth actually briefly confessed to this crime. I sent you the audio tape. You can use that, right? It's, um, she took it back. Of course, I took my confession back as well. So there's a lot of talking in this case. But when, if you eliminate all the blah, 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 and look just at forensics, right? Just the forensics, which can't lie, then there's nothing of mine at the crime scene, but there is forensic evidence indicating other people at the crime scene. Um, one of the things that I always find really fascinating is um, the fingerprints on the old plum brandy bottle that are ignored. The Netflix series talked about Elizabeth's fingerprints on the vodka bottle. Why are they important? Because both of her parents have elevated blood alcohol levels and their glasses there. So the victims clearly drank alcohol with the perpetrators. So it's significant that Elizabeth's fingerprints are on the bottle. It's not absolute proof, okay? It's not absolute proof, but it's significant. And next to the vodka bottle was an old plum brandy bottle and an alcohol glass. And they have fingerprints on them that are unidentified to this day. And um, that's included in the, um, in the Chuck Reed report which I've now sent you the whole Chuck Reed report, um, the, the, the forensic report on these fingerprints. The victims were inebriated. 
and there is an alcohol bottle and an alcohol glass with unidentified fingerprints. That's not a coinkadink, right? That indicates somebody else. There was a glass with liquid in it? Um, that's my understanding. They were next to each other in the bar. That's my understanding, yes. And um, th There's a photograph of the bar with the open doors in the Chuck Reed report. I... Um, and you can use that. Um, you can use that. That's, that's that a crime. Trial. Yeah, that's, that's a crime scene photograph. Um, this is all material that um, Chuck Reed was collected and put together. And so you can see, you can see all of this. This is not stuff anybody has to trust, all right? Okay. Um, the report is in there as well with the fingerprints. Nobody has to trust anything. Um, the only thing you really have to do is, and again, I'm not claiming I can prove my innocence. Of course, I know I'm innocent, right? But I'm not claiming I can prove my innocence. All I'm claiming is there is more than a reasonable doubt. And somebody cut me some slack somewhere, right? Would somebody cut me some slack and grant me the reasonable doubt? You know, I think, I think, I think I've learned that. <laughs> so did you have a question, Jim? No, just look at this screen. You can ask me. Okay. All right. You're up on a screen up there. So I'm looking up there and you're here on my laptop. So um, I'm every. Uh, uh, now I have forgotten the question I was about to ask. You, you just said, look at the Chuck Reed report and the lab report. Oh, my. Meeting is going to end in 10 minutes, so we might have to read. So we have to do redial, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Zoom just changed its. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. Because it was like un unending for two people. Yeah. Um, so, for one thing, I, I mean, I don't think it's totally preposterous that people could leave at eight and go drive to from DC to. Lynchburg and get there at a time, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 30, maybe uh, at that no. time, at that time, the traffic wasn't the way it is now. Cause I drove to Baltimore all the time and that was four hours and DC was closer. Yeah. You also had to UVA to DC would be even closer. Sure. But, um, um, uh, the speed limit back then was 55 miles an hour. You know, it's, it's, you have a higher speed limit now. You had a, a speed limit of five, 55 miles an hour. And of course, I haven't driven in Virginia since uh, the 1980s. Um, you know, the people who have looked at this closely, which is Chip Harding and Richard Hudson and Stan Lapikas, um, back when I was still in prison, uh, they told me that's uh, back then at that time, four to four and a half hours. OK, well, but if his, but that's not. Because I lived, moved here in 90 and drew back and forth yeah. to more from Lynchburg, and that yeah. was four hours. And, yeah. we, and DC is three hours from Lynchburg at that time. Now it takes forever, but yeah. at that time. So, you, so, you know. We're also, yeah, I mean, you, you know, of course, you know, they lived on the other side of Lynchburg, and it's a very, very small country road with a lot of twists and turns, and it's dark at that, you know. But so, my point is, yeah. if Elizabeth calls them, if Elizabeth calls them and says, hey, mom, I need to talk to you. I'm on my way. Would you mind waiting up? Mrs. Haysom was in a coat, uh, a bathrobe. You don't think they might wait up and have a snack? Close to midnight. You know, we're not talking, we're, talk, we're talking about sometime between 11 p.m. and close to midnight and then sit around and drink alcohol and eat ice cream. How do um, we know they don't, aren't it's, night hours? It's... it's <laughs> You know, you can you can bend and twist this. Um, you know, what is probable? What is a reasonable explanation? What is not something that is a real, real stretch? And I remember specifically um, when I was still in prison, um, Chip Harding doing an interview. Um, Chip Harding was the at that time he was the sheriff of Albemarle County, and he spent a year and a half working this case really, really hard. And he answered a question like this one, right? And he said, it's absolutely possible that Jens Zuring did this, but he would need a helicopter, right? So, <laughs> you know, it is always possible. It is always possible, right? It is an, it, I'll give you another scenario, right? Which is not disprovable, right? Elizabeth and I and 
two other guys whose DNA was found at the crime scene. Total of four people committed this crime together, right? It's not possible to disprove that theory, right? And I'm just really lucky because I wore a plastic suit and gloves and I'm the only one who left no forensic evidence at the crime scene. You know, you can, you know, you can make it, you can make it into a game. You can make it into a game. But the fact is, if you're talking about legal standards of what is a reasonable, a reasonable, you know, it's, you're talking about a reasonable doubt, right? There's no forensic evidence there of me, right? Um, and it's not about, could he possibly have maybe still somehow have been at the crime scene? That's not the standard. The standard is what is a reasonable explanation and, you know, that's you know, that's that's what I'm did not get in the Netflix series, um, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it's it's and it, it's that's and it, it it it's disappointing because I feel like that standard has not been applied throughout this case. Um, um, I think there's been a, a lot of twisting and pulling of evidence. Um, and interpreting it in the worst possible way for me, right? Um, without making an attempt to, to, to look at it from a reasonable point of view, from this point of view of reasonable doubt. I think the only people who really did that, right? To be fair, is actually the jury at my trial because they were initially split six, six and they were given false information from a very, an, actually an evil person, right? A Robert Hallett. Robert Hallett was responsible for the wrongful conviction of Charles Fane, who spent 17 years on death row in Idaho. Um, and this is in the Chuck Reed report, right? The testimony he gave at Charles Fane's trial is exactly the same as mine. You know, my footprint is too long to make the sock print by seven eighths of an inch. So Robert Hallett basically misled the jury and said, ignore the length because his heel might have made a double impression. And he made the exact same argument in the trial of Charles Fane in Idaho, who spent 17 years on death row until he was exonerated. And he's in the National Registry of, Exon uh, of uh, uh, Exonerations. And, um, you know, he, this is to me this this double impression of the heel on the, on the footprint right is a little bit like well you could have still made it to the Hastings house right around midnight and killed them then right <laughs> you know it, it's that's not what we should be doing here we should be do, we should be looking at this from you know somewhat reasonable point of view and in Idaho you know, I'll, 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 I have no, I don't know anything about Idaho other than that they did the right thing by Charles Fane because they recognized that this sock print testimony of Robert Hallett's was just false. And this is not also my opinion. This is Brandon Garrett, who was at UVA and is now at Duke University. He's one of the leading experts on junk science. Um, you know, Virginia could have done the same thing with me. Virginia could have said, you know, your verdict was based in large part on the testimony of somebody who we now know is a liar, Robert Hallam, right? And we're not going to give you an absolute pardon, but we're going to give you a conditional pardon, right? I think Virginia could have done that. <laughs> the governor of Virginia could have done that. I'm, I'm glad he let me go, but I, I, I don't think that really recognizes the extent of the evil that Robert Hallett did at my trial. And um, he took 30 years of my life with that lie. Because without that sacrament testimony, you know, the jury would have said, ah, not, maybe not innocent, maybe a hung jury, but a hung jury is not a conviction, right? <laughs> you know? Sure. But here's the point here. You, you have a confession which you say you know yes. was false 
and a print that does look similar to yours. The, the forensic podiatrist in the Netflix series, you know, did another analysis of it and pointed to the sleigh of their first and second toe. No, it isn't a fact that that's your print, but you could deduce that it's so similar to yours. Yeah, but that it's also session was accurate. Yeah, the, right. And but but the thing is, right? It's also there's there's a footprint of Elizabeth's that is similar to that sock print, and there's a footprint of Julian Hastings that is similar to that sock print with the sleigh between the. the um, but it, it, Look, I didn't see that. That, that's, that. that that is that is that is the problem. That's that's why sock print analysis is not real science. Okay, um, and Chris Fabricant talked about this at the beginning of episode four of the Netflix series, right? Okay. Right. So the answer to that is is that this is why it's junk science. There's actually in this particular sock print comparison two issues. Yeah. Um, Robert Hallett and also this pedologist of the Netflix series are comparing a footprint with a sock print. And the sock over the toes changes the position of the toes compared to a footprint without a sock. That's a huge problem that's never been addressed and they keep doing it because they don't have sock prints of me um, or Julian Hasem or Elizabeth Hasem. All they've got is footprints, but it's the wrong thing and one of the people whose affidavits you have, Russell Johnson, addresses this. The other problem is the whole junk science thing. In 2015, the FBI um, admitted that 96% of the FBI scientists' testimony about hair was false and misleading. 96% uh, was false and misleading. This affected thousands, possibly tens of thousands of cases. And hair analysis is similar to sock analysis in that you're saying one thing looks like another thing, but you have no statistical basis for knowing how often that happens by coincidence. And Chris Fabricant, who's at the beginning of episode four, just released a book that actually, I believe, hit the New York Times bestseller list. Um, you know, he, he explains this as does Brad and Garrett, who's at Duke University, without a statistical basis, you don't know what the significance of this is if one thing looks like another thing. And that is not science. It's, you know, all you're saying is this looks like that. Okay, but how often does this happen by coincidence? And there's no basis for this. You cannot know. And what I'm saying is, yes, the top of the sock print resembles my footprint, but the same thing applies to Julian Hasem. It's not me saying it, it's the Bureau of Forensic Sciences saying it, and it applies to Elizabeth Hasem, and that's Russell Johnson from the New Jersey State Police and Frederick Webb from the FBI Crime Lab saying that. The only fair thing to say about the sock print is that that could have been left by just about anybody and I bet you, I bet you, Noreen, that you could leave a sock print or a footprint that would probably be a pretty good match. You just have to make enough of them, all right? And one of them will match. And to call somebody guilty because of that is just not fair. It's just not fair. Tell me about that recording that you shared um, that included Gail Sterling Marshall and Ricky Gardner. That is from a ger German television program in 2011 uh, called ZDF Zoom. And um, Gail Starling Marshall, um, who is the former Deputy D Attorney General of Virginia, who then became my lawyer um, and is a friend to this day. One of the really wonderful things is that in 2021, two years after my release, we met up in Paris. And, um, you know, that, that was a wonderful moment for me because she supported me from 1995 until today. She's a great, great person. Um, yeah, so what she said is that um, uh, she could find experts without any problem who were able to testify what I just said to you, right? Mm -hmm. Sock prints are not science. 
you know, and to convict somebody on that is not right. And Ricky Gardner, astonishingly, in this TV program from 2011, agrees with Gail Marshall. She says Sockburn comparisons are hogwash, and Ricky Gardner says she's right. She's absolutely right. But we never said that that is Jens Zuring's sock print. We only said it looked like a sock print. And that second statement is simply not true because in his closing arguments, Commonwealth's attorney, Jim Updike, who's now a judge in Bedford, said specifically um, that Robert Hallett determined the sock print to be mine and that it matches and fits like a glove. If you need those transcript pages, I'll send them to you. I believe the I idea, have them. Yeah I, yeah, I believe you do. Yes, yes, and, and, right, I sent them to you. It's, they did say at my trial that that's my sock print. And in fact, it's not, it could have been Julian Hasem, it could have been Elizabeth Hasem, it could have probably been you. You know? They never put Elizabeth Hasem's foot over it for an overlay, correct? No, what they specifically did, and this is, this is really interesting stuff. Oh, I'll tell you about something else in just a second, but this is really interesting stuff. At my trial, Robert Hallett spent most of his time with my footprint and the side print. And then he very briefly showed an overlay of one of Elizabeth's footprints of the side print, and it looked different. And then after my trial, that New Jersey State Police Officer Russell Johnson, who, whose affidavit I sent you, also wrote a letter to the editor and said, that is just junk science. I'm from New Jersey State Police. I did this all my life. This is not right, right? And that got my lawyer to then actually go into Robert Hallett's file after my trial. And he found this other footprint of Elizabeth's right, which was not used at my trial, but which was in Robert Hallett's file, and it looks very similar to the side print. So my lawyer then files a motion for a new trial with Judge Sweeney, but my lawyer is from Michigan, and he doesn't realize it's not called a motion for a new trial, it's called a motion to set aside a verdict. So Judge Sweeney denies the motion and says he used the wrong wording. And then my lawyer resubmits it with the correct wording, set aside the verdict, but now he's over the 21 days and Virginia has this 21 day rule that 21 days after sentencing, the judge loses jurisdiction of the case. And so Judge Sweeney, even if he had wanted to, could not have even looked at this new footprint of Elizabeth's and no court, no court has ever looked at this footprint of Elizabeth's which was in the file all along. And this was not suppressed evidence because the footprint was in the file and my lawyer just goofed. He didn't, he didn't go into the file and, and check all of the footprints, um, which he should have done. But, you know, the, one, the guy who gets to sit in prison for all of this is me. If the jury had seen this other footprint from Elizabeth's, and Russell Johnson, I sent you his affidavit. Russell Johnson says that this is also not proof that this is Elizabeth's foot. It looks like Elizabeth's foot, just it looks like my foot. But with Elizabeth, the size matches. And with my foot, there's three sevenths of an eight inch difference. And Russell Johnson says, as does Fred Webb, this is just, this is nonsense. This should not be used either against her or against me because the side print doesn't prove anything. Let's move on to, you have, you have requested a new pardon. What makes you think that this could be successful this time when you haven't been successful in the past? Um, it's a new governor. And um, one of the strange things is, is that of course, um, this is, it's not a legal process. It's a very personal and individual process. And I'm hoping Governor Glenn Youngkin uh, is the person he says he is in his public portrayal. A man of justice, a man who looks at things with new eyes and is different from his predecessors. This is an opportunity to show that he's different. And I have really strong new evidence, right? Which did not get included in the Netflix series. And I think it's outrageous. 
Tom McClintock is in the Netflix series. He's a professor there with you in Lynchburg at Liberty. And um, in the summer of 2022, um, on August 1st, the Department of Forensic Sciences allowed him to return to the lab. And I'm very critical of the Department of Forensic Sciences, but in this instance, they did really, they did something really good, something really great. He went in there and he was allowed to examine the raw data from the DNA tests with, together with an employee from the Department of Forensic Sciences to make sure that he didn't do anything crazy, right? And they looked at this stuff and they determined that the four blood samples that are the key blood samples in this case, 2FE, 6FE, 23K number one, and 7FE number one, those four blood samples are not mixed and not contaminated, okay? That sounds like a very technical thing, right? But it has great significance because 2FE and 6FE are type O blood and 23K number one and 7FE number one are male AB blood. Nancy Hasten had AB blood, but she's a woman. She would have had XX chromosomes. These two samples, 23K number one and 7FE number one, have XY chromosomes, all right? And so they have to be somebody different than Nancy Hasten. And 2FE and 6FE are type O blood. And uh, in 2009, the Department of Forensic Sciences determined that I'm excluded as a source. And the only way to call any of this into question is to say these samples have been mixed or contaminated. And it doesn't mean anything, right? And there's actually a weird chubby guy in the, in the Netflix series who says that it doesn't mean anything because it was all mixed and contaminated, right? But, but that is specifically, that is specifically what Tom McClintock is now ex excluded. He says, with a Department of Forensic Sciences employee at his side, they were not mixed or contaminated, which means that the results were trustworthy, right? And we did not have that when I was still in prison in Virginia. This is new information since my release. It happened just last summer. And I gave this to Netflix. They actually interviewed Tom McClintock, but they did not put this into the series, which I think is outrageous. And I asked them why they didn't do it. And the way I understood their response, right? Um, too complicated for the viewers. Right? Um, I don't think it's that complicated. There are DNA test results that show that there were two other guys in the crime scene, not Jens Zering. People say the blood samples were mixed and contaminated. Okay, let's check it out. Tom McClintock goes there, figures out not mixed and contaminated, and Tom McClintock will speak to you. I've asked him, right? He's, he is not happy. <laughs> he is not happy that this is being ignored because this actually moved the state of the evidence forward, right? We now have new facts and the governor has new facts with the pardon petition. And it's not from, you know, it's from Tom McClintock for heaven's sake. He's testified in over 100 cases as an expert witness on DNA. The guy is pretty much famous, right? And he's from Liberty University. How can you ignore that, right? Of course, to go back to your earlier theory, right? Is there some way I can still be guilty? Yes, I could have committed this crime with these two unidentified men, plus Elizabeth Hayson, all four of us at the crime scene together could still somehow make me guilty. But in, a, in the real world, all right? In the real world, we now know with, you know, un unless you're a conspiracy theorist, Tom McClintock says, the blood evidence points to two unidentified men at the scene. And that's new evidence. That's new evidence. Why it's do actually you... Sorry. Yeah. Why, why, do you, why are you still pursuing this? You're a free man. Because I'm not freaking guilty. I didn't do it. All right. If I were guilty and my only goal were freedom, I would have come out of prison, changed my name, and disappeared like somebody else we know. All right? who shall remain lameless, but is living in Canada, right? Um, me, I did not do this thing. And I appreciate Governor Northam letting me go, but he did not declare me guilty, and I will not stop saying that I am innocent. I will not stop. 
you know, we'll, we'll see each other again 10 years, <laughs> you and I, right? I'm not giving up. They, they, they did not beat me down in 33 years in prison. They sure as heck are not going to beat me down out here. You know, it's just, I didn't do it. I did not do it. And like I said, I now have new evidence, thanks to Professor McClintock, that does not prove my absolute innocence, but raises major questions. And you better take a good look. You better take a good look. Um, why would Professor McClintock lie for me? Why would he be wrong? Why would Professor McClintock be an idiot, right? You have to answer those questions, right? Because <laughs> if he's not lying for me, if he's not an idiot, there were two other guys at the crime scene. So tell me, the word is that you are now profiting off of your story, going around this country, with dinners with Yens and um, having events and speaking engagements. I had, exactly, I had exactly two speaking engagements this year in Germany, exactly two. I am not profiting off this, okay? I tell you who's profiting off this, Netflix is, right? Netflix is, they're making millions off this. And they're not the ones who spent 33 years in prison. I am. I spent 33 years in prison. I did not do this and I did not get compensation, um, which I think is one of the reasons why they didn't give me a pardon, right? They, I would have been entitled to $1.4 million. But I got released at the age of 53. I'm now 57. Um, I have no retirement savings, right? I have no education because Virginia does not offer anything beyond really a GED. They've not changed this recently, by the way. Recently, they've changed it. But when I was in prison, um, you could not get anything beyond the GED. Um, so I'm having to scramble to earn a living. I'm working as an online coach. And today, I got my first American client. I've been doing online coaching in Germany. And that's and, and, and in-person coaching as well. But I've been doing uh, online coaching with resilience, right? Um, coaching, you know, how what exactly? Overcoming hardships, resilience, right? How to deal, there's a seven step process with dealing with difficult life circumstances and fighting your way out to freedom, right? And it's based, it's scientifically based, but I lived it. This is what I did for 33 years in prison. That's why I'm not a broken man. And that's, why, that's how I got out, okay? There's seven principles, you apply them, you will succeed. I'm the living proof, all right? And it works, I'm the living proof. It works specifically really well with toxic relationships, right? So I've been doing this in Germany and um, I'm now ex expanding internationally. And today I got my first American client. I'm very happy and I hope uh, she is only the first. And, um, you know, if, if you are in a difficult life situation and you feel like you'll never get out, I know I was there for 33 years and I did get out. And I can show people, there's a structure to it. You know, there's a structure to the steps you have to go through with yourself and with me as a coach, I help. Um, and you can, over, you can overcome anything. I overcame the death penalty and I overcame two life sentences that I was supposed to serve consecutively. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. Because I'm honestly, I'm, I'm nobody special, I'm really not. I'm, I'm, have yeah. you? Have you profited from telling the story for the last five years? Maybe you've only had two this year. Yes, like I said, I've, I've, been, I've been making enough money to get by, but it's not been more to get by, more than getting by. I'm not getting rich by any means. And Netflix does not pay for interviews. Did right? any of the producers pay you for interviews? Um, uh, no, 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 no. You do not get paid. No, nobody pays for interviews, also in the German media. I, I, when, I, when my book came out, I published a book and I'm just like anybody else entitled to write a book about my life and get royalties. There's nothing wrong with that, all right? Um, and I did interviews in the media and people think that you get money for that, but you don't, right? The publisher sends you there and you get paid for hotel and train tickets, right? And So you were traveling to sell your book Yes. 
and that's perfectly legitimate. Book it's book. perfectly legitimate, right? I'm, I, you know, it's not, you know, I'm, you know, <laughs> it's perfectly legitimate. And again, what would you do if you come out of prison after 33 years with nothing? I had $53 when I came out of prison. I got to earn a living. I'm not, I'm not taking government money. I have not accepted one cent of uh, uh, social security here in Germany. I've worked. I'm a writer. I published six books in prison, right? I published a seventh one after my release. That is perfectly legitimate, right? Mm -hmm. What would you do after somebody steals 33 years of your life? And again, it was my life. It was my life. The Netflix producers didn't spend 33 years in prison. It's not their relatives who died here. The Netflix producers, they're profiting from something that is not even theirs. It's not even their story, right? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned um, that the that the DNA was left out. What else, was there anything else left out that the producers had? God, this, I've actually, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm pretty active in this, in, as a, on YouTube. Uh, I actually have a video on 20 pieces of evidence left out of the Netflix series, all right? All right. Remember at one stage, through, no, we're not gonna go through all those, we're not gonna go through those, right? But right. I've sent you the audio recording. Elizabeth actually confessed this crime briefly, and that fits that fits with the forensic evidence placing her at the scene, all right? It's not enough by itself, but it fits with other things. Um, the fact that there's a second genetic scientist, in, in addition to Professor McClintock, that's Professor Moses Shanefield, right? Gets completely left out of the Netflix series. He says the same thing, right? It's not just Professor McClintock who says this, Professor Shanefield says this as well. Viewers ought to know that. Um, Remember at one stage they talked about how Elizabeth said, I arrived back in Washington, DC in the car, draped in a bloody bed sheet. Do you remember that scene in the series? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Well, they did, they did a luminol test on the car. Chuck Reed, um, who did the Chuck Reed report, was the one who performed the luminol test and Ricky Gardner supported that in a radio interview. Chuck Reed did a luminol test of the car and there's absolutely no blood in that car, proving that this story of Elizabeth is not true. Uh, another thing left out of the Netflix series, about two months after this awful crime, the Hasten family decided to clean the house, right? So that it could be sold. And one of Elizabeth's brothers, Howard Hasten, and her mother's best friend, Annie Massey, observed how Elizabeth removed her shoe and put her own foot over that bloody sapra. I sent you that transcript, right? Don't you think viewers ought to have known that? Um, there was an FBI crime scene profile created by one of the inventors of profiling, a man called Ed Salzbach, right? Mm -hmm. And he was in the previous documentary saying, yes, I wrote an FBI profile and it pointed to a female perpetrator in a close relationship to the victims and then in 2018 there was a press conference and I still have the videotape I can give it to you but I believe you were there right, right. Stan Lapikas found the FBI file the profile was not in it but there were other documents in it summarizing the profile and showing Carl Wells the sheriff back then requested a profile and it says FBI Quantico performed a psychological profile. And it points to a female perpetrator in a close relationship to the victim, right? That's not in the series. Why, <laughs> you know? Um, so now I'm at four or five of the 20 things they left out. Um, yeah. uh, you got enough, you got enough? Yeah, right. I mean, I, I I will look at, you said you sent it to me, the 20 things they left out, or you have- It's on my website, it's right. on my website. And I also did a YouTube video about it. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, is there, okay, I think. I have, you know, I have something else to, to, to pick.
pitch here. If you, if you, if you want to ask me what else are you doing with your life? I'm just... <laughs> yes, well, what else are you doing with your life? But trying to... um, I did an audio book, right, um, about my relationship, the early days of my relationship with Elizabeth Hayes. It's not about the crime. It just describes my relationship with Elizabeth Hayes um, from when I met her on August 25th, 1984, until our arrest on April 30th, 1985. And it describes those months and it's four hours long and it's dirt cheap and it's available everywhere for their audiobooks. It's called Love, Sex and Murder. And, um, and Why I'm doing- did you do that? Because I think this crime had a lot to do with our relationship. And I wrote a book about that while I was still in prison called A Far, Far Better Thing. And this audiobook is eight chapters out of that book. That book is about the case as well. But I left all of that out with the audiobook. The audiobook is only about the relationship. And I think people ought to know. I think people are interested in that as well, right? And so this is something that I wrote while I was in prison. And now I've released it as an audiobook, leaving out the crime stuff because I'm really tired of talking about the crime. But the relationship, that's interesting. And it feeds, it fits into my coaching work because I work with people who, who've been in toxic relationships. About half of my coaching clients are people who are in toxic relationships. And a lot of the times it's difficult to recognize that you're in a toxic relationship. That was my problem when I was 18, right? I spent a lot of time working on this. And my book, this, this audio book, is about the most toxic relationship there ever was in history, maybe. Maybe there's a couple worse, but it's, it's pretty damn bad, right? So it, it fits, fits in with my coaching. And I'm doing a podcast called Sympathy with the Devil, True Crime from an Insider, where I talk about other people I'm in prison, I was in prison with. And the first three episodes are actually about Virginia prisoners. I've also got upcoming episodes about guys I was in prison with in England, but it was it's about my last cellmate, who is a really nice guy, and is still in prison and he's probably gonna die in prison, even though he's a really, he's a really nice guy and, and he's innocent, right? Another episode is about Steve Epperly, who is the first guy in Virginia to be convicted of a murder without a body. And I met him, I knew him, right? The third episode is about Harvey Cruz, who um, is a, well, he's my cellmate for a year. He's a pastor from Newport News who um, you know, cheated on his wife and shot his lover during a drunken sex game in church. So, yeah, you know, right, right. So why, why wouldn't you make a podcast episode about that guy, right? Um, do you get he, paid for the podcast? No, I'm, I do this myself on Patreon. And um, I'm, the idea is that you put this material out there and people come to you and then once you've got a kind of a backlog of, of episodes, then you can ask people on Patreon to support you. But first you have to deliver something. So I'm figuring, you know, I'll, I'll have to do this for, you know, several months before I can start to monetize this. But there's a process to that. And listen to my podcast. It's, it's they're about half an hour each. Um, What's it called? Sympathy with the Devil, oh, yeah. because I don't want to get sued by the Rolling Stones, right? right. If I call it Sympathy for the Devil, the Rolling Stones yeah. sue me. Okay. Sympathy with the Devil, the Rolling Stones can't sue me. And it's called Sympathy with the Devil, True Crime from an Insider. And right now it's for free. And it's, you know, it's Patreon. I have to learn all this stuff since I came out of prison. You can, you can synchronize Patreon with Spotify. So you can listen to all this on Spotify. You don't have to go anywhere else. Is it right? in German? I do a German version and I do an English version. Everything I do, the audiobook, the coaching, uh, the podcasts, I do all of it in two different languages. And um, yeah, so um, check it out, it's on Spotify. It's, it's it, as true crime podcasts go, you know, everybody else, you know, you've got ex-police officers and everybody else. I actually lived with these people, right? So different perspective. Um are you unable to get like a job in a company? I mean, you have the intelligence and, yes. you know, in, in, many you know what? things you're capable of. Are you unable because of your history? In, in the United States, 
I believe I would have very few problems getting a job because the United States is a meritocratic society, right? If you're good, people hire you, right? You succeed based on whether you can do stuff, right? And that's what I admire about the United States. Germany is very different. Germany, you only get a job if you've got the necessary paperwork. You've got to have a degree. You've got to have an education, right? And I came out at the age of 53 with no money. I had to start earning money, right? Basically straight away, right? Um, not straight away, but I had to start earning money. And um, contrary to rumors in the United States, the educational system in Germany is not free, right? And it's certainly not free when you're 53 and older, right? I would have to pay for an education and I still have to pay rent, right? And feed myself and health insurance and all these other things and try to save up a little money for uh, my retirement. So I have to scramble, right? I have to scramble. And I think um, in the United States, it would be easier, but it's hard. It would be hard for me to get a job in Germany without formal qualifications because it's a different country. It's a different culture. And, you know, all I can say to Governor Youngkin is, give me that pardon. I'll come back to the United States, get me a green card, and I'll work hard as hell. Pay taxes over there. I'd rather pay taxes in America than pay taxes in Germany. Um, I miss the United States. You would, if you got a pardon, you'd be able to come back? I, should, I would ask. I would, I would try, yeah. If there's no reason why not to. If, if, I, if my conviction is overturned, sure, I could come back. Because I've got a lot of friends. I've got a lot of friends in America that I really would desperately like to visit, um, especially Steve Rosenfield, who's very sick. Um, yeah, I would love to go back to America. I'd, I'd like to live there. Look, there are a lot Germany, of people who don't want you here. That's 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 okay. I don't have to come to Virginia. The United States is big, you know, um, and there are also a lot of people who do want me there, Noreen, right? Including a lot of people in Virginia, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to move in next door to Ricky Gardner in Bedford County, but there are pl I get plenty of support from Virginians. Um, yeah, I get plenty of support from Virginians. And last night, just last night, I spent over the over an hour doing a FaceTime with Chip Harding. Mm -hmm. And um, man, I would love to go fishing with him. I'm trying to talk him to come to Germany, go fishing with me here. But yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I don't I don't have any grudge against the United States because as you pointed out earlier, Noreen, and it's the truth. And you know, I lie to the police. And this I, I'm the one who got all of this rolling, and it's nobody else's fault. If I told if I had if I had called the police straight away on the night this happened, none of this would have happened. If I would have told the police the truth when I got arrested, none of this would have happened to me, right? To me. Um this is this is my fault. I should have told the truth. As soon as I had the opportunity, I didn't do it. And I tried to be a hero for my girlfriend, who, of course, you know. It's true. You know, well, she, she never loved me, right? I just released a YouTube video about this. While I was in prison, um, my lawyer got hold of letters of Elizabeth Hastings, Elizabeth Hastings. Um, somebody gave them to her that were 30 years old that showed that she was cheating on me with another student, another man, from the very beginning of our relationship. He's now a doctor on the West Coast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, that's something. So um, if, I mean, okay, that begs the question. She's manipulating you. Yeah. For what purpose if she's the killer? Or if um, anybody guy. else is the killer. They, 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 Manipulating they, you for fall, what? Fall guy. Fall guy. I was, I was, you know, fall guy. You know, if you're smart and you're planning on doing something bad, you plan in some patsy, some nitwit who's going to be your fall guy. She couldn't know that you'd confess at the very beginning of um, your relationship okay. that you would eventually I, I, confess yeah, because this, this is mentioned in the netflix series that i have to be careful about how i talk about i, my I know mind. that yeah but but i can say this right um 
at my trial, I testified, right? If I phrase it like that, I'm on safe ground. At my trial, I testified that she initially asked me to be her alibi, not her fall guy. And I was the one, according to my trial testimony, who then said, that'll never work, the cops will never believe us. And then it was my idea, my idea to say, God, I'll take the rap for you. I'll say I did it. My dad's a diplomat. There's no more diplomatic immunity, but I'll just get deported to Germany and I'll get 10 years in Germany. And this was not her idea. This was my idea. Yes, according to my she, go ahead. According to my trial testimony, yeah, and I have to phrase it like that. According to my trial testimony, um, she came back and said, you have to be my alibi. And, you know, I think that was a reasonable conclusion for her to believe that I would do that given how much I was in love with her, right? But are and you saying also, that, I'm sorry, are you saying that she formed a relationship with you knowing that sometime later she was gonna go kill her parents and have you be the fall guy? I am, that is one of the questions that is difficult for me to answer under legal restrictions here in Germany, okay? Which I can answer this and I've got lawyers telling me I should answer it and, you know, just basically dare her to sue me, okay? But I'm not doing that because I want to obey German laws and, oh. um, okay? Yeah. But, but, but I am not the only person by a long shot who believes that Elizabeth Hasten basically targeted me and chose me pretty early on in the fall semester of 1984 as somebody who was the kind of person she could manipulate because I was back then um, very emotionally immature. I was, you know, this, this you know, you know um, what's the guy's name on Big Bang Theory, right? <laughs> I was intellectually gifted and emotionally, you know, retarded almost, right? Um, I was very immature emotionally and socially, and but very, very smart back then. Not no longer that those days are over with, thank God. Um, and that kind of person, somebody who's very smart, but socially and emotionally kind of incompetent, is easy to manipulate if you have, if you're highly skilled in manipulation. And even she herself testified at her trial that she was skilled in manipulation and often did this. You know, that she's, that's her testimony, not mine. At her trial, she said, yes, I lie all the time. Yes, I manipulate people. And I believe that she targeted me for exactly that purpose. And whether she had any specific intent at that point already, I have no way of knowing. I have no way of knowing. But I know that she saw somebody that she could wrap around her finger. And um, yeah, I think she she made a good choice. If, if you would. Back then, the 18-year-old Jens was an absolute idiot. And um, she wanted somebody to manipulate. She picked the right guy. All right. Any final words that you need to get out about the Netflix piece or anything else? Um, we have one about the Netflix piece. About the Netflix piece, really not so much. Um, what I think is really, what I would really hope for, I really do, right, is that Governor Youngkin, now that he's got a Democratic legislature, has his hands free to do some things with his executive powers, right? And a pardon is a matter of executive power that maybe he wasn't able to do before when he had a Republican legislature, right? He can do the right damn thing here. And he can show people that he's got courage where his predecessors from the other party did not have that courage. Ralph Northam, let me go and I'm grateful, but it takes courage to say, hey, this guy, even if he doesn't complain, give me an absolute pardon, at least give me a conditional pardon to recognize that there's a reasonable doubt. That's what a conditional pardon is. There's a reasonable doubt. I'd be so grateful for that. Plus, with a conditional pardon, can't go back to the United States. He's keeping the country safe. 
<laughs> all right. I'm never going to stop fighting. That's the other thing. To all, you know, everybody who's in high school and wants to become a politician later on, I'll be reaching out to you in about 10, 20 years, okay? Because I'm not giving up and I'll be doing this when I'm 90. Thanks for watching the ABC 13 YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos and live coverage and local stories, click to subscribe and download our ABC 13 News app.